Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to our um, summer lecture series uh, that we organized in the School of Architecture. And um, this is actually our last lecture of the uh, of this semester because the semester is about um, we're only like two weeks before finals. Um, but it's been great. It's been a great um, sort of group of invited guests, uh, practitioners and, and professionals in the field, which is part of the idea with these uh, lectures, um, I mean, according to our classes that we teach in, this, in the summer. So it's been, you know, uh, fascinating to see people. We've been shifting schedules, as, as you know, Roberto, like some, um, some have been in the afternoons and some in the mornings because of people in LA or different sort of schedule conflicts. So this is the benefit of this platform right, that we can we can have people from all overseas and, and you know it's um, amazing which is great yes so um, let me just do a quick uh, intro of Roberto Espejo and uh, and then you know I just give you the, the microphone if you guys can please uh, mute your microphone so then we don't get um, some background noise right. so Roberto Espejo is a principal of C Studio. Uh, his, um, his practice is a pretty global practice. I mean, something that I will ask you to elaborate a little bit uh, further when you when you talk is that um, part of the, the the idea behind C Studio is that it's a group of classmates that um, work collectively on projects in different places. I think that's a pretty interesting idea, especially for students who are basically building up their network. With their, with their classmates, and, and, uh, and it's, it's always uh, incredible. Um, one thing that um, stands out um, with this lecture series, actually, is not only you, Roberto, but some of the other guests are people who stay in offices for long, 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 long periods, which is not common um, in architecture. Um, sort of, someone's on. You should tell someone yeah. to mute. Salmi. Can you please mute? Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So that's 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 pretty impressive. I mean, Thomas Wong's been like in the same office since he graduated. Um, Ewe Sonji with Morphosis since he graduated. You spend, you know, a big chunk of your life, professional life, um, with Sister Pelly uh, in New Haven, right? So that's actually kind of an accomplishment because architects tend to move. Um, and, and um, you know, from offices, from cities, from like depending on, on sort of different lives. Um, and today, Roberto is going to talk about the, the arts uh, center, the performing arts center, who, which looking at, the f at some kind of old photograph and the same archives of the, uh, of the center, it's been changing names so many times. Like so uh, in the flyer we did my uh, performing arts center because still around here we see the, the sort of the, the, the science is performing arts center like PAC, which I, I'm sure a lot of people don't know what that is <laughs> these days. <laughs> so it's, uh, um, I mean, it's, it's going to be great to hear you talk about something that took so long and you were in the office since the competition all the way to the end. Um, Roberto's practice is also um, an international practice. I mean, you've been involved in projects in Latin America, but also in Europe. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it, it's going to be um, interesting to hear you talk about like large scale projects, like, I mean, master planning, you're interested in urban design, um, but also like, you know, how to get to details when you're designing such big, uh, sort of complex buildings. Um, so welcome, uh, Roberto and, and Yes, I'm going to mute myself and, and hear you talk. All right. Well, thank you, Henry. And um, this is a giant privilege. Um, as we were just saying earlier, um, when Henry told me uh, and Jason Chandler, the chair of the School of Architecture, asked if I could talk about the nuts and bolts of what it took to kind of build the Performing Arts Center, not just physical nuts and bolts, but the political obstacles, the kind of uh, addressing the user groups, the trust, all of these things. Um, and if someone would have told me at the very beginning of this that I was about to engage in a 12 year long project from the competition until opening night, I would have told them, no, thank you. I'd rather design kitchens at Home Depot 
um, and bang those out five or six per week. But I couldn't give away this experience. Um, just a little bit of background. I, um, I had the privilege of going to University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana where Cesar Pelli actually also went to school when he came from Argentina on scholarship. Um, I, had a, I, I studied in, in, in Versailles in Paris uh, as a junior year abroad and out of complete luck, I, I tell people I feel like the Forrest Gump of architecture because I found myself in places that I really didn't think I should be. So um, I... Um, I, after that year, I got a, a kind of conversation with one of the office people in Barcelona for Ricardo Bofil's Taller de Arquitectura in Barcelona, and uh, was able to work on the Olympics uh, for 1992 in Barcelona, like when I was 23 years old, 22 years old. Um, then when I got back to Champaign-Urbana, there was Cesar Pelli on my senior thesis, um, an alum that was asked to come for a week to review work and he asked me to come visit New Haven um, and I didn't even know where the hell New Haven was um, and so when a buddy of mine said I'm going to pick you up at the airport take you to the interview um, I'm going to go check out the business school at Yale and I was like what the where the heck is Yale is Yale actually a thing um, and it was right across the street um, luckily, I, 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 I worked with Caesar on a tremendous amount of projects, started in 1985. Um, I spent 23 years. I started when I was 23, right out of undergraduate. And so I spent half my life working there on projects that, you know, again, I just, I was, pinch me, I was dreaming. I, there's nothing more exceptional about me than anyone else. It was just doors and windows opened. I stuck my fingers and feet in it and then just kind of just, um, as my father says, showed my ex ex infatigable enthusiasm for what I do uh, and what I'd love to do, which is taking little building blocks and put coloring with crayon pencils. Uh, and that turned into a career in architecture, which is just, um, I should have started working with when I was five because I could have been drawing a salary way back then because uh, I was doing it then, but I'd be a multimillionaire now. But, um, but in instead, I'm just an architect that uh, had, again, a privilege to work not on one of a million projects, uh, one of a million architects that could work on a performing arts center, but it's one in several million. Um, very few architects get to do a performing arts center in their life. Um, and I got a chance to do one that, again, um, was just, just epic in proportion. And, and to just to give a little, context. Um, I can't talk about the nuts and bolts of how the buildings put together and students. Um, I, 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 I look forward to this. You know, when Henry said I need to kind of talk about the Performing Arts Center and you have 50 minutes, I figured out that uh, 12 years and 50 minutes um, is like a year every couple of minutes. I, I forgot the math, but I realized you want to turn your phones over because if you look down at a text, you're gonna miss like seven, eight months of the project. So um, just kind of put your phones as far away as possible because I'm gonna rapid fire. I literally am gonna go from the competition all the way to opening night and some. But way back when, in the 80s, um, Miami's reputation, its brand, was uh, basically Miami Vice and uh, Scarface. Uh, it was a difficult place um, to get their arms around. It was very transient. People were coming in. People were ru you know, rushing home. It's the only Friday nights in my life that people were all going home to watch Miami Vice and these beautiful people and boats and, and uh, you know, behaving badly. Um, and there was a group of people, you know, titans, pioneers of culture for the arts, for Miami, um, and I'll miss some if I don't, if I start naming them, but I will say, you know, Parker Thompson, who uh, is actually the father of Meg Daly, who's creating the underline, Woody Weiser, um, who was the head of the foundation, for Parker, the trust chair, the foundation that raised the private money. Judy Weiser, I'm so pleased to see her, uh, his wife, who was also a trust, a, a board member, trust member, one of the 11 voting people during the competition. Um, there were um, the names like Norman Brayman, Ron Esserman, uh, Ted Arison, who owned the uh, Carnival Cruise and 
and uh, you know Miami Herald, Knight Ritter, um, and uh, the list goes on and on. I know I'm missing people, but um, Jim Heron, uh, and and then on the municipal side, you know there were several county mayors, Merritt Sternheim, uh, eventually at the end uh, George Burgess, but also kind of assistant county mayor people like Bill Johnson. And I'm just naming names, and this is probably not so super important, but it goes to tell you that in Miami, you know. They, they had director of cultural affairs in the 80s when people said Miami didn't have culture. And it wasn't that Miami didn't have culture, it was just not organized. And, and as we know in the world, there's places in the world where they built cultural institutions to fix its urban problem. I mean, one of the most famous ones is Pompidou Center in Paris, where that was where all the garbage came to Par in Paris. All the garbage uh, would go there. And they need, and it was in the middle of the city, so they need to clean that up. And they built Pompidou Center, um, which is uh, just an extraordinary building that not only housed museum and performing art spaces and, and uh, lecture spaces and libraries, but it created an urban stimulation um, that really changed things. You know, um, lots of iconic uh, projects. I mean, obviously, Sydney Opera House. You, you know, before Sydney, Sydney Opera House, when you mentioned Sydney. Um, Sydney, Australia, you thought of koala bears and, um, you know, uh, kangaroos. Like in Miami, it was kind of, you know, uh, people in the sun in the fun, fun in the sun and sun in the fun um, and uh, fast cars and fast boats. So um, now you say Sydney Opera House and that iconic um, kind of silhouette of a building that kind of sits on the edge of the water. Um, the program that we received, the, the trust formed in the mid 80s, and it wasn't until like the early 90s that they had their arms and legs uh, to create funding, both private and publicly. And um, the competition, you know, it was an international competition. You had to have done a performing arts center before because architects have tended to screw up these buildings really bad. Uh, you can go to Garnier's Opera in Paris and skit a ticket in front, behind a column. And, and if you see any images of Garnier's Opera, it's all the lobby and people standing in the lobby. And they used to say, you know, uh, uh, ar architect, uh, there's columns in front of seats. And he's like, well, everyone knows that you, no one goes to watch the opera. You go to be seen. And so he designed a lobby of just a bunch so that you can be seen in your uh, beautiful gown and then you'd kind of go to your seat and fall asleep for a couple hours. Um, but in Miami, they, they asked that 40, um, they asked that you had to have done one before, so there was 40. <clears throat> and then they shortlisted them to eight and the seven, and they were, <clears throat> well, Cesar Pelli, <clears throat> um, Rem Coolhouse, a very young Rem Coolhouse, remember this is 26 years ago, <clears throat> um, Architectonica, I am Pei, who'd done Meyerson Hall in Dallas, um, uh, uh, David Schwartz, who did Bass Hall in Dallas, Senderbrook Architects, who had done some um, uh, projects, and, and I might have forgotten a couple. The, the, the competition was set up where <clears throat> there was a public interview, Sunshine State Law, it was all at the Omni Hotel and you had to sit there all day and like anybody that could come uh, would listen. And there was a board of kind of called Architecture Review Board. And that had people like Vincent Scully, Susana Torrey, members of the faculty, George Hernandez uh, from University of Miami. And they would advise the trust chair, Judy and the rest of the other uh, 10 trusts uh, to give recommendations. Um, they shortlisted three of us, which was Architect Tonica with Elizabeth Platter Zyberg and Andres Duani, Pelly's office and Rem Coolhouse. And they put us in a hotel room uh, at the Omni Hotel, one on top of the other, looking down at the site. Um, it was crazy because they were going to have us there for seven days, straight days. Um, and we started on a Friday night. Each of us gave a lecture on Saturday night, and we were going to give a presentation. We started on Sunday night. Um, uh, sorry, and the lecture was, I think, uh, uh, the next Saturday night, and they voted on Sunday. I, I forget exactly, but it was seven days, and we o I only went out for air from that hotel room one day. Um, but the rest of the time, we were there with a, with a 
a, a, a copy machine, a fax machine, and a bunch of pencils and paper. Uh, we ran down to T-Square, got a bunch of foam core in true Caesar Pelly fashion. We just started cutting up cardboard and crunkling up, uh, um, you know, trace paper and uh, attempted to make a model. But, but when my, Miami's uh, mission in the mid 80s was to br basically bring the great of the greats of all the performing arts centers, learn from the mistakes, but take advantage of all the great things that happened. Um, of course, uh, Carnegie Hall, Myerson in Dallas. Um, there were several other halls that people, the trust traveled around and looked at La Scala in Milan, the horseshoe shaped our, our opera hall. Um, and, but they wanted it, they didn't want architecture to be grade A, the highest priority. Because again, architects tend to get in the way of function of the buildings. And this was really meant to be the greatest performing arts center for acoustics and theater planning. The goal was among five of the halls in the world. We were going to try to match that. Um, and I'll just do a shout out, Damien Doria, my equal to Pelly was the acousticianers on, on the call. So if people want to ask questions about the acoustics, the acoustics was completely insane. Um, but, um, and I'll get into that specifically, but, but when Miami wanted the most acoustically perfect world, uh, uh, on the world performing arts center, they picked the most horrendous site. Um, we were splitting, split by a US federal highway. We had Dolphin Expressway flying uh, in front of us. We had cruise ships that turn around and blow their horn to the left of us. We were on a flight path to MIA and six feet below the site was the bay where we had to kind of dewater at 90,000 gallons a minute to make sure that we got the water out of the site enough to be able to pour concrete, literally pushing a bathtub into mud that would sit on top of 1,100 piles, columns that hit the bedrock. So that if there was a major blowout in Miami or kind of flooding or a drought, these buildings would be there uh, over 100 years uh, later, standing on the the the, the rock. So, so um, the mission was to build a, 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 a you know you could we could have done a, a one single hall, which was um, you know what most cities do a multi purpose hall, but because when you put ballet and opera and concerts and theater and uh, symphony uh, and dance all on one stage all of them get, have to compromise. Um, but if you separate those functions, you can have a theater that's just completely based on focusing on theater, the, the, experience, the suspension of disbelief, the curtain opening and closing and not knowing how that world transforms behind that curtain. And then across the street, a little music box, an, a, a pill-shaped building with a big acoustic chamber around it, which is like an empty space, like the belly of a cello, so that when a note would be played, there would be a reverb, a bang, that would simulate like a Gothic cathedral. It would be that much, or close it down with acoustic fabrics and, and banners. So, so separating the function. Then there was all these little user groups, 40 of them, I think. You know, Opera House had Florida Grand Opera, you know, Ballet Opera House had, the ballet had uh, Edward Bellella and the Miami City Ballet. Across the street was the Miami Symphony. Michael Tilson Samus was kind of giving us his wish list at the world, um, New World. Um, but this little itty bitty 40 little user groups, the little kind of ba African American ballet. 12 year old group of kids. Um, I think Florine Nichols, one of the trust chair, she, she was forming a, 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 a little kind of girls, boys ballet company that was extraordinary. Um, and we wanted to make sure that they weren't just sitting in this 2,500, 2,200 seat hall. So one of the goals was to create a little intermediate theater, a black box theater that could take 200. So that, that kid doing his piano recital felt like he was at Carnegie Hall, full house. 199 people with standing room only in the lobby. And that's just his family, if it's a Cuban uh, family, the 200. So that's a little bit of, a lot of bit of background, just kind of setting up the challenges and the goals that we had. And I think the images will help kind of me 
navigate through um, uh, some of the things I'm talking about and, and, and the te tectonics. Now, Henry, um, I'm going to push. Yeah, that. you can share. You can share the screen. Yeah. Okay, and I'm going to share. And then <clears throat> my viewer crashed last night, and so, and I saw Henry in true fashion. Um, you know, I was up until about two in the morning tweaking this thing because this lecture, by the way, is a lecture that was uh, it was created. Uh, Elizabeth Flatter-Jayberg at UM six months before a 12-year project, 11 years and six months into this project, Elizabeth asked if I would give a lecture at uh, the lecture series at UM, and I said, what date? And she says, all of them. So Wednesday night at, at uh, 7.30 for 13 weeks, I was able to break down this um, process <clears throat> over 13 different lectures. It was like therapy. I was standing in front of this audience basically crying um, of the things that we went through. And so this one, I had to condense 12 lectures down to one 50 minute one. So I've already used half of it. So, um, so anyway, in 19, early 90s, 92, 93, when we got the program, we were giving this poster of downtown Miami 2005 as if that was projecting way into the future. Nobody was gonna know what Miami was gonna look like. And oddly enough, looking at this poster again, you know, it talked about this trans transit airport port sort of tram, another tram that would go out to Miami Beach, um, you know, this, this uh, trade and exposition district, a Flagler marketplace, a kind of, you know, walking, semi-walking street, um, you know, uh, of course, government center and, and uh, somewhere wedged in between all these red lines. And they should have the flight path with MIA was the site that they gave us uh, for the Performing Arts Center. And when we got there with the poster, we were like, oh my God, you know, like there's, it's like parking lots, like everywhere. And there's an abandoned Art Deco building, another kind of, you know, sort of empty Art Deco building. And, and only three, you know, I love this picture. I hadn't quite, quite noticed until last night. Yeah, really, uh, three or four, I mean, look at Miami, by the way, guys. Can you sit here at the Omni River uh, Station and see the Freedom Tower now? Um, we've got um, um, uh, SOM's Wachovia building, uh, IM Pays, Centrust, I guess now Bank of America, and Hugh uh, Sevens, uh, who did the Stephen P. Clark Center, and the Freedom Tower. That's about it, as far as kind of sort of known kind of architecture. But notice this move right here. The, the road of Bayshore Drive used to kind of kink so that the trucks can go right into Miami Herald, and you'll see one of the sort of Herculean moves we had to pull off. But you know, we, the Sears uh, Corporation donated the site, of course, because this thing was being held up by pigeon dung. And um, across the street, Knight Ritter and Miami Herald donated one of their four parking lots. And this thing was crazy. It, it was the most point of most contention. The historicist said you cannot touch the oldest Art Deco building in downtown Miami. And the other people said you cannot keep the, that old nasty building uh, of the Art Center. And it's funny, there was this armature right here, this kind of, kind of tumor that grew which was the whole kind of um, parking like car service place that had bled hydraulic oil all around the site. We didn't discover it until we started digging. Um, but the competition was up in the Omni and what we decided to do, because we didn't know much about Miami. You know, we're up in little old New Haven, Connecticut. Yes, I'm Roberto Espejo, father of a Yucateco uh, son from Mexico and a Cuban mother, but I was born in Peoria, Illinois which my mother still calls Peoria, wor Worstville, because going from Havana to Peoria, Illinois, it's like the worst thing that could have happened uh, for her. And I grew up and stayed there, and that's where I went to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. But we asked everybody that came in. We didn't know what to do. We didn't have a preconceived idea of the project. And we asked them to, to send us pictures, bring us stuff, bring your books. We went to the you know copy store, and just started copying everything we knew. And I love looking at these boards now. These were these panoramas around the site and around Miami and all these highways. This was kind of foliage, you know, the flowering and the things that you, the color that you see. I think uh, my head's in the way, but back here, there's kind of more of the historical buildings. And, um, and then over here, which is great because Wynwood is defined as the kind of neighborhood that had all this crazy graffiti. I think Yammy, Yammy, I love Miami is still there. 
Um, and um, so um, the very first diagram, we, we could have done, uh, the first instincts was to have the both lobbies face south of the beautiful view. But once we started looking at it urbanistically, we realized if we point both lobbies looking at downtown, which is obvious, um, the back 14th Street would be filled with nothing but truck docks and back of house work, use, things that don't require windows, which would have had as much impact on the urban kind of fabric, of another rip that 836 Dolphin Expressway did splitting Miami in two. Um, so we did a very controversial thing and took the concert hall and faced it north and put the back of the building facing south. Truck docks in different parts. So we took all the functions and tried separating them as much as we could, the major functions. But the one thing that Cesar really, really, really felt passionate about is this uh, performing arts center needs a living room. It needs a place to kind of go. It's the, tropic, uh, the tropical weather and uh, we wanted to create a room and that room was gonna straddle US Route 1. Uh, but the but the idea was to turn them in an angle, let them go off the grid so they could feel like one building, and it'd be like an experience of outdoor plazas, indoor plazas, outdoor plaza, an indoor plaza, and then a plaza that we built for the Miami Herald Night Ritter. Um, we took that idea, and even though it was a one to forty model, one uh, inch, uh, one forty feet is one inch. Um, we decided to, to, to study it much larger. Caesar wanted to do an eighth inch model in this hotel. Uh, and we had to go buy exacto knives. And so we created that diagram with, with the fly loft in the theater that was given to us and the, and the concert hall and of course the Sears building. And I always say, you know, half of the people wanted to get rid of it, half of people wanted to keep it. And so we kept half. So we compromised and we kept the better half. Uh, but the whole kind of plaza idea was really the uh, impetus. So we took this model to New Haven, and you can see our, our competition studio. We're still unpacking boxes. Um, and you can see the 1 to 40 model right here, the little one that we were kind of like building, which was part of the requirement of the, of the competition. But we, they said you can bring, ex you can do extra stuff. So we figured extra would be the seven foot by four foot model. Uh, that we would kind of sort of surprise everyone with. But and that idea of like going, traversing through the building as a linear experience, a new street, uh, kind of started be realizing with these cut areas where we could stick the stairs out and there'd be a visual connection all the way up into the building. So you could actually experience the plaza like these little kind of Pope's balconies. <clears throat> and that diagram, again, we took these crepa, if you don't know what crepa, Pencils are kids, uh, students. Uh, they're these really soft crayons and they're super fun to draw with. So put your computer away and buy Craypot because it's a really great way to sketch these diagrams. But, you know, and, and just quickly in dumb, dumb colors, blue was the performing space, performing arts space is on the left of uh, a ballet opera house with two rear stages and side stage, uh, a rear side and a main stage. A concert hall, then that's where the patrons sit, a studio theater, the truck docks. Um, in the dark yellow is the public indoor space. In the yellow is the public outdoor space. We consider the, the lobbies outdoor. And red is all the support that was required. And you can see that there was a smaller site here. So we put the smaller building here and it was still had enormous constraints. With the crepa, we decided to be very visionary and start having a lot of fun at the street. And really, we wanted to design the building from the street, but everybody kept like looking at it from above, like everybody does when they look at an architectural model. And the whole idea was to take the very top height of the, of, of the fly lock and cut the stepped walls down as much as we could to reduce the scale of the building. This is a 150 foot tall right here, a 10, 5, 10 to 15 story building um, with no windows above the third floor. So they're not very friendly neighbors. And it was very difficult to make this thing be um, sort of contextual, even though there was no context. We were surrounded by parking lots and a highway. So this was the massing, the one to 40 model that we created. And you can see the whole yin yang relationship with the sort of kind of Arabian Persian carpet that we bought and rolled out over US Route 1. The backstage door entrances turned into these things called the glass lantern. 
And the idea was, and I came up with this term, um, well, it's the first time I had heard of the ther term omnidirectional. We wanted the building to look like you were walking to the entrance from whatever direction. So if you're coming here, there's an entry. If you're coming here, there's an entry. If you're coming here, there's a, if you're coming here. So, so you felt welcome. You felt safe. You felt like you can get to the building and you were going straight to the front door. And we took that model and stuck flashlights in a Sears building, actually tried buying dry ice and letting it smoke and it melted by the time we got to the presentation. Stuck plants, we made these, I don't, don't tell the Omni Hotel, but we spray painted in their fire escape, uh, these palm trees sitting on styrene tubes. Um, and um, believe it or not, uh, and I won't get into it, and we'll do a longer lecture on, on the whole process. And Judy knows it was an 11, voting public, Architectonica was the team to beat. REM came in kind of not exactly uh, sure of the political landscape in Miami, did a pretty bold scheme, which I can talk about in another lecture, but it was horrendous. He st stepped on every single landmine he could. But when we brought this model and people actually can get their heads in it, it was, it was all over. We were able to even split the model so people can get their heads down here and feel what the living room uh, would look like. So we won. The vote was seven to three to one. Rem got one um, and we got seven and we were just privileged. All three did amazing schemes and, uh, and, uh, and kudos to Elizabeth and Andres and Lorinda and, and, and Bernardo, but they ended up getting the commission to do the American Airlines Arena down the street anyway, so we don't really feel too bad. Um, for them, they, they, yeah, Architectonica has not been lack of work in Miami, I hear. So ha us having done this one was, was not too shabby. Um, and uh, sort of then they said, oh, by the way, did, you tell, did we tell you in the competition that we weren't picking a scheme, that this whole process was picking an architect? We wanted to see how you worked. Um, now you have to start all over. And we were like, what? And like, you have to start all over throw away this design. So it took, uh, because that process was going to be long, and you can see all the programmatic pieces cut in little, little uh, foam course squares, you know, the wig room, the wardrobe room, the star dressing room, the kind of stage manager's office, um, all of them stacked up and we realized, oh my God, these things are way bigger than we thought. So we decided that instead of having the street going straight to the entrance, we decided to abandon the street that was over here, cover it over with asphalt and cut a new street, street straighten out 14th Street so that Miami had some organization in this area. People couldn't believe we were suggesting these things, but again, these were just parking lots. Uh, and then uh, we spent a year negotiating the contract. So during that year, Miami Herald and Knight Ritter and uh, a group that uh, enlisted us to do this urban design action plan, it was looking at the surroundings and seeing what could be. The Florida Grand Opera was gonna build the headquarters. The school board was gonna build a parking lot with retail that th this could be used as parking. Knight Ritter was gonna build parking here. Possibility of a couple office buildings and condos and uh, retail that would surround the entire um, plaza that we would call the Miami Herald Plaza. Um, so we did this diagram, this master plan diagram, and this is the five minute walk. We asked people, so um, it's kind of a shady neighborhood, sketchy. Um, how, like if you had to park and walk, how, how long do you, are, do you feel safe? And they said five minutes. So we stood right here and we walked up in every direction. And when it was five minutes, we made a circle. And we went and knocked on the door of all the property owners and the city about letting the park come to the center and letting this be its front yard. And all these people could possibly provide parking for the center because of uh, program function and budget, they did not include parking and still don't. Um, just surface parking. and. And it's coming, you know, you build it and they, they will come, but I think we're at year 15 and there's not a dedicated parking, but I still have hope. Um, and I'll design it if anybody needs anything to design it. But the, the, but, the, but, but the impetus, again, the goal was theater planning and acoustics. It was not architecture. Architecture was going to be B category. So the concert hall, which was literally a musical instrument, it, it had this canopy that would raise up and down in three parts that would create compression of sound 
over the stage so you didn't need speakers and the musicians got immediate reaction. We had these doors that were five and 12 tons that opened and closed into this reverb chamber that created that bang, that depth, that, that volume and that liveliness, they call it. Um, uh, and then the idea of these small, thin balconies that felt like they were just perched on the columns and the people were just sort of floating. And, 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 and uh, 200 uh, choral seats for the uh, choir, but also for patrons, an experience where you can stand behind the stage, look at the conductor, and be part of the performance and aligned with the first box tier so that, you know, a person right here, um, Henry and his wife, could be sitting right next to Pavarotti or Placido Domingo. Um, and a stage that would kind of rise from the orchestra level all the way up into these risers, choral risers. And another stage that would lower, upper and lower, where these seats could go all the way down, a stage could come up and the stage could come all the way over to here. Oops, sorry. Um, so uh, over across the hall, again, it was La Scala. It was, a, it was a horseshoe shape. The idea was to let the proximity of you and the center stage be almost equidistant. So almost like if you were gonna create a shape in here, it would be a sphere. Um, and this is where the horseshoe cut off because we had to take a picture of the model. But into the programming, um, they decided they needed 200 more seats because Broadway wanted to come here, Broadway across Americas. And we loved the 2,300 seats, very intimate. 2,500 seats was a real challenge. Uh, and we'll get into some of the tectonics here but, 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 um, of, of the ballet opera, but ours was to create a lobby that was as grand and big as possible, open, like as glassy as possible, so that it did feel like you were outdoors, uh, creating these giant Berendel trusses, steel trusses, and, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But acoustics, 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 and this is a very famous presentation where you can see the theater models, but back here, is the, the stucco building. Um, it was supposed to be stucco and maybe, maybe some stone at the base of the stucco columns. And we did it dark orange going up to light with a diagonal reveals. And it looked like now after experiencing Miami for like a few weeks, uh, like a, a fancy Publix. Um, but it was not a world-class looking building. Um, and, but the acoustics were gonna be amazing. Russ Johnson, one of the great late Russ Johnson, great acousticianers in the world, Damien's mentor of many years. Um, when he was talking about acoustics, Caesar walked over to the ballet opera model and ripped the ceiling off that we had spent several hours putting together to see if the acoustics worked. So it was a light moment, but there was someone in the audience, one of the 11, 11 uh, trust uh, chairs, uh, uh, trust members who raised her hand and, and that's Judy Weiser, uh, an amazingly uh, uh, kind of, passionate person about doing the right thing in Miami. And if we're gonna get here, let's do it right. And she asked the question, Caesar, is this a world-class building? Is this architecture world-class? And she's on the line, so maybe in the questions answer, she can pose the question the way she did. But Caesar politely said, well, Judy, it's world-class acoustics and theater planning. But in a very polite way and diplomatically, Caesar says, I can't, think of a stucco building in the world that I would call world-class. And they asked, what would it take to be world-class? And you can see some of the shapes had flattened out with VE, value engineering. They were taking cost out. By the time we got, this was 100% design development. We were ready to draw construction documents. The, it was flat as a pancake. They took all the glass objects off. They straightened out the lobby walls so that it was just kind of very conventional. Stage door entrances were were tile and glass block. We've never seen that in Miami. And all of a sudden, um, Caesar said, well, Judy, return the forms to their heroic shapes. They need to be buildings that are looked at like dolphins coming out, haystacks that move in the landscape. Um, increase the glass, bring back the glass lanterns. And you have to make it out of stone if it's gonna be lasting like all the great performing arts centers in the world, it has to be natural stone. So they asked how much would that be? It was a $160 million budget, it was $55 million. So, so $55 million more. So we launched into a campaign for a little while, fundraising campaign, 
to, to design the building out of stone. And uh, this is a watercolor, kids. It's where you take paint and you dip it in water and you put it on paper. I know uh, uh, it seems like something from the 18th century, but we didn't have, to put it in perspective, there was no 3D modeling in 1993 when we designed this building, no CAD 3D. Um, so this was a kind of the bicentennial park at the time. It was called kind of bleeding underneath a very quiet I-395, I-836. Uh, uh, and, and you can see the Freedom Tower and things. Um, these, these perspectives on bringing the heroic shapes, returning the glass shapes, um, making the stairs. And they had gotten rid of this wall, just made it one flat wall. So this idea that there was this turning corner of glass. They made a model that cost over $100,000 to kind of go to donors' houses and car showrooms and all over Miami. Um, and this model had an elevator. We said, we're not gonna have a model that looks down onto the roof. And this thing had a lift that would take it all the way up to five feet so you can look at the building from below up, uh, which was important because everybody kept looking at this massive building from the roof and no one would ever experience it that way. Um, so that model was taken physical. That was a picture of the model taken on Miami Beach with natural light and put into um, a, um, a photo montage. And, and, and does anybody recognize Miami here? I mean, again, um, there's the Freedom Tower. Uh, uh, it's grown. <laughs> Let's just say in 15 years, Miami's gone somewhere. So when we broke ground after a year and a half of just negotiating contracts and designing and, and then six years uh, documenting, designing and documenting six years to go to bid, um, we only got around to building, designing in those six years, um, building a one story with a roof parking garage, half part of the Knight Ritter Circle. And for a while, I thought that this was gonna be the only thing that I had in my portfolio in case I went to get another job for six, seven years. Um, here's the piece of the Sears building that we demolished. And what else did I want to point out here? Um, this is where the excavation started and you can see the water starting to pond. Uh, oh, and by the way, um, this is one of those Kababian rug places that are always having a, a going out of business sale. And that one actually did go out of business. I think it's the only one in the entire sort of market. And who knew that from there that, that, that would grow, from that site, those little shovels would grow. And, and once we were there and we called it being half pregnant, people didn't believe this project was going to happen. And being half pregnant is being pregnant. And I know that because one week after getting here, we found out that Sebastian, my son, was going to be born. Um, so the buildings, including Conception and Sebastian, are exactly the same age. And we watched Miami grow. Just look at Bice, uh, B Biscayne Boulevard. Look at the amount of construction trucks there are. The synergy that happened in the city, the impetus that happened when this thing was nearing completion. They said someone had a number that 60,000 condo units were being planned for, designed, planned for, or under construction by the time we opened in Miami. There's our Knight Ridder Circle. And, uh, but again, we were building these 500,000 square foot, 150 tall buildings in the middle of a city that really was just starting to grow. Um, and uh, they are big buildings. Again, you know, so big that we had to put um, rainwater uh, drains pretty much at every uh, uh, mid part and edge. Um, you can see the only three stories of glass, four stories of glass. Um, you can see um, smoke evac systems, which were tested. This is a big old fan vent like on top of your stove that if there was a fire, the smoke had to evacuate in something like seven minutes so that it wouldn't suffocate people. Things that you can't even imagine uh, we had to do. Um, but the most important thing and the thing that I just was so passionate about in the, in the, in the studio, we lifted the model up at eye level and, and, and literally it was to carve the building down so that the elements all felt like the same scale, the backstage door entrance, the piece of the Sears building, the big hundred foot by 70 foot um, lobby. So when we started building this building, I mean, as a guy that took every single one of these pictures, um, it was just a dream come true. It's like a kid playing around with kind of building blocks and imagining it being actual real building, understanding scale. Um, and, you know, at the street, uh, as massive as these buildings were, people actually don't think, they looked at it as, as an architecture as a whole, but they didn't really, people were driving by this thing, looking at it at 75 miles an hour. 
uh, no one was getting out um, on the street and looking at it. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. This was the view that we really thought would be amazing from Mickey Arison's uh, uh, Miami Heat uh, American Airline Arena. And, and the real photograph was actually better than um, the model. Um, so the toughest wall was this sort of west facing wall. This is a 150 foot point and it had to kind of get the closest to the street. So we literally had to bend the walls and mass it backwards, make sure that we picked stone that was very evenly um, kind of blended so that it felt like it was kind of carved in stone and, and, and then let the kind of weave of, of different kind of stones um, uh, kind of create a, a pattern. And, and these kind of rings of Saturn, we called them these moldings and copings that cast shadow, not only below it, uh, but on top of it, um, so that the building felt less massive. Otherwise, all of these walls would have fallen into each other visually. And we even did a thing where below the copings and, and, and the parapets, we would do a big kind of half inch, uh, three quarter inch um, uh, reveal. And then above, it would be butt joining, where you put the stone right next to each other with caulking. So that felt carved and this felt very intentional, just trying to break down um, the building and and the the little this was a, a nice uh, uh, we used three seven different uh, quarries in the world um, to to uh, put skin this building inside and out uh, but the three exterior stones were uh, two Brazilian stones verde maritaca and uh, topaz gold and then this was a a stone um, called topaz be uh, sorry Sardinian beige from the island of Sardinia in Italy. Uh, you may ask what these things are. These are overflow scuppers because uh, there's so much water that would collect in these roofs that we needed something in case the drains would um, overflow. So we actually custom designed these to make them look part of this kind of ship. But again, the, the studio theater could have been inside this building and no one would have recognized it. But we wanted it to be on the corner, on the street for the kid that comes back from college and says, I danced there when I was nine, nine years old. Um, so it had its own address and it almost like next to the 150 foot building uh, at the pedestrian level, it was, had, it was heroic. It actually was the only 90 degree angles in the entire building. I think we had 72 different facades uh, uh, drawings on this project. I will point out that something happened. We think that a lot of the stone for the east wall broke. They brought stone without consulting the architect that fell out of range. And we had a procedure where, you, if, in case one of these broke in a hurricane, um, you had to break it out and replace it. So we made the builders um, completely replace, knock out each one, oops, each one of these little black marks um, and re-blend the entire wall, which was not very popular. And now they cover it with a big billboard. So I don't talk to my Italian friend anymore that came to visit it in Miami. He's not super thrilled. Um, but, um, the, the, again, the thing that connected the soul was the bridge. And the bridge um, was the thing that at some point, see, they wanted to take it out for cost. And Caesar said, you take the bridge out and you save a couple million dollars, you're gonna have to pay me to redesign the entire building. Because I designed it with the idea that it would connect as one single building. And imagine, I think if you go US Route 1 from Miami all the way to Canada, um, there's not any, hardly any places where a bridge goes over and pavers go across a U.S. federal highway, which you can imagine the approvals there. But you can see, now I, I noticed this last night, you can see that this is when they started ripping the stone off again. Actually, I think this is where they broke and they covered it in blue and didn't want us to know that the stone looked terrible. But this picture is crazy. I mean, just to go to show you, we have finished glass. We have the streets already partially paved. We have even the fountain is in place, but they're still pouring concrete on the, on the uh, box tier. Um, and there's little glimpses of stone over to the right. I don't know how much you can see with, with the faces, uh, of the Zoom faces. Um, can you see the Zoom faces, Henry? Or is there a way to minimize those? Oh, I mean, I what, what do you mean? The Zoom faces? We, we the, have, you, you must have them at the top. Yeah, I got. I just minimize it because I, I yeah. can't look at myself. No, it's it's different. We get to we don't get to see reactions. <laughs> oh, you want to? Well, we're worried about. Oh, well, actually, you know what? Let me. That's Henry. That's all of us. Okay. So if I start speaking, do I come back on? 
Yeah. Oh, there. All right. So a secret place on the project was um, we, we convinced people that this was dead nuts online with government cut. And if we had any chance of being Sydney Opera House, which they wanted, some wanted it on the park, but we said it's not very urban having uh, that there with 5,000 parking spaces uh, around it uh, would be like a football stadium. So we set it back and it also the sites were free, so we couldn't turn those down. But this view, there's a window at the Art Center. I challenge you guys all to find it. It's public. You can buy a ticket and find it and you can get this view. Um, and um, so we, the, no, nobody, they wanted to take the lighting off uh, for cost cutting and, and we rented this little sh uh, pirate ship um, to take all the kind of builders and the people that wanted to take the lighting off to prove to them that the art center really was, did feel like it was on the water. Here it is partially still the stone being put on. Um, and then the other piece was, you guys realize you can see it from the cruise ship, right? Zillions of people. And someone actually took this picture and sent it to us from the deck of their cruise ship. So there was a real chance that this thing could have that kind of Sydney Opera House effect. And coming from Miami Beach, they were saying, what's it going to look like in the back of the building facing us? And, and again, we could only have done this with a physical model. Um, carving out this thing in cardboard and styrene and plexiglass. Uh, we were able to come really look at this and and i'm so proud that we were able to come really take and and please the the historicists somewhat that we could create this blend of kind of modernity with the kind of beauty of the kind of details that we had been lost i mean they were just completely covered and this sort of duality there's the uh, custom made overflow scupper but this contrast between the old and the new was something that was so important like someone that was in Miami in the 1940s and comes in 2020 they would see this and go gosh I bought my dad's necktie at that Sears uh, for Father's Day but this whole idea of like an embedded piece of glass a jewel like a piece of quartz that's growing out of stone was one of Caesar's original sketches it was this idea of just glass a glow that would come out of a carved form so here we go the building of the building of the building. Um, here is, uh, we go to seven different, uh, got stone from seven different quarries. This is a slit in a mountain in Carrara uh, that you go to kind of check out the stone. And just to give you an idea, these are the blocks that are larger than my apartment. Um, and um, then uh, the builder asked if we, if we, they, we spent $2.4 million on just mock-ups. There are 42 mock-ups, uh, full-size mock-ups. Um, so um, they said, do we really have to do an aesthetic mock-up and a testing mock-up? Because remember, this is 1994. This is the first, after the arena, the first mass assembly building being designed after Hurricane Andrew. So the South Florida building codes were being challenged, like, you know, they're being tested for the first time. So we said, yeah, if you, if you build it with the people that are actually gonna build it, <clears throat> the block guy, the concrete guy, <clears throat> the steel guy, the stone guy, the window guy, everybody has to go out there and build it, all the trades. We'll take a look at it, we'll approve the detailing, and then you can test it. So we looked at it, imagine this. I mean, that column is not a solid column. That's a cut in a curve, and that's a steel piece of I-beam. Uh, going through these columns, supporting the building. Um, we flamed the stone, which is burning it with a flame, literally, and it knocks off the minerals and creates sort of a reflective surface. Uh, and, and that reflective surface catches light during the day. And so it almost kind of with the kind of rings of Saturn, be almost in little sparkles become sort of a sundial. And then after we kind of approved the aesthetics with some comments, they bring this giant kind of like a road warriors um, machine that would spray water with a static uh, test water testing, which is just spray water on it and then suck air in and out to see if it would hold. Then they bring a big old World War II airplane engine, they crank it up and they blow wind against the building at 100, 130 miles an hour with the water. That's a dynamic water test. And when it caught on fire, we were like, yo, yo, it's on, it's on fire. And the guy like looked out of his booth and said, uh, it's all right, it happens all the time. And, and so he just turned it up like louder so it would blow it out. Um, and 
the goal was to create, uh, you know, with the glass now, I, t I told you, we wanted a gla the glass to go away. We wanted the columns to go away, but we were supporting a 120 foot by 70 foot wall of glass. So um, we started making the physical model, Verendale of Trusses, you know, really creating, trying to create that space. Um, did testing for this, this you'll think is crazy, but this was a, in a vacuum chamber that would blow air and suck air for breach barrier that happens in hurricanes. And we tested it and looked at it, we looked at it and approved it aesthetically. But then they started doing the same thing, blowing wind against it, shooting water against it. And I think you probably heard this. This is a testing lab near um, uh, the Miami airport. It's a crazy, you could do, a, it's like a movie set. Uh, but they would shoot two by fours at 80 miles an hour at the glass. It had to go mid span, mid, at the edge of the mullion and in the corners. We created like double laminated, triple glazed glass that the first piece of glass would be the sacrificial glass would receive the major impact. And on the inside, if a drop of water dropped into the interior space or air, they would reject it. the test fails and we'd have to do it all over again. Um, that's what we had to do to then to design the structure. And I know you guys are studying steel, we did a wind tunnel test up in University of Western Ontario. They built a plexi model and they put all these nodes that were connected to a computer, every single part of the building. And then they created the context around, there's a highway, and then they blew massive amount of air at this thing and spin it around on a turnstile. And that allowed, uh, that basically those forces measured, not just weight of a roof, but what happens when there's 100 mile an hour winds. It allowed us, to understand that we could put thinner columns towards the front, uh, a Verendel truss that would connect to a, a, a larger column, um, horizontal supports that would almost create this kind of grid that would support the glass. We were able to kind of create these cross support braces so that the trusses could get be smaller so that they wouldn't shake back and forth. And a really cool thing that you won't be able to notice unless I point it out, we realized that it was acting like a boat sail. The forces were really tight at the edges because the wind was going really hard around it. But in the middle, it was like lofting, like a boat sail. So we realized that the Verendel truss pieces did not have to be that close together. So up here, they're really close together and here they're really open. And we wanted to do that because that would allow better views through the through the trusses. So if you go up there, you'll notice that 99% of the people don't know about that. But imagine this entire wall is, is held up by these bookends, these concrete shear walls. And, and, and literally we were able to wrap the corner with this little itty bitty thing. And you know, uh, I just still get goosebumps. You know, this is, these are eight foot piece, four by eight pieces of glass. They were built a unitized system in Dallas. Uh, Th these pieces were built in a factory because we couldn't put these together one by one on site. It would be impossible. So they were brought in. This is spandrel glass to hide the structure. And you can see this corner that nobody can believe it's being supported. But it's because of that big Verendel truss when you put two steel columns together and connect them horizontally. And, and, and here is how the glass is held. I mean, if you see my hand, we had a, we had a, oh, I'm going to spill my water on me a little kind of brace that would hold the horizontal tube and then a shelf that was screwed on it that moved this way and moved this way. So we could literally hold each kind of section of unitized glass, so that one single unit being held on these literally bitty kind of adjustable uh, hands. Uh, and you can see that corner, I mean, and, and I will point out that, you know, in the model, it's kind of too late to go back, but we had not had these steps in the ceiling, but we realized that the distance from the door all the way to the ceiling was like 25 feet. So we decided to create a step uh, in the ceiling to let the kind of entire interior of the building feel like it was carved. So from the tiers that kind of go out to the 300 extra seats up here, to the kind of stucco ceiling that kind of goes all the way to the wall and then columns that are held away from it so that it does feel like it's holding up a tent, um, also, you'll think this is crazy. There's seven different custom colors of white because the white that was near the windows was looking different with the natural light against the white with the incandescent. So we literally blended on site 
the different paints so that the building felt more designed and not just contractor white. Um, but the glass was just, you know, a huge achievement. We, you know, facing south in Miami with coconuts flying everywhere during hurricanes, um, we were able to pull off, pull off the impossible. Not even the arena could do this. Um, a giant screen of glass. And one night the lights uh, kind of lit up from our trailer. Everybody freaked out, just glowing. We had no idea what it was. It almost felt like a fire from our window inside. We came out, we ran across the street and we realized <clears throat> we, it was the first night um, that the electricians had turned on the custom lighting. Uh, these little pieces of bent glass, frosted, no fixtures. We wanted it to be many points of light. And we literally kind of went through and it was just this idea that the whole place was just this kind of glowy thing. And I'm gonna race through this. There was a arts and public places program where five artists were asked, look at the models, look at the drawings, propose something. And the great Jose Bedia uh, designed a, a, a rail with the story of the Caribbean and Santaria <clears throat> and his mythical figures. And he literally came with eight and a half by 11 black pieces of, of cardboard or uh, car, uh, construction paper with those gold and silver pens that you use at, at Christmas and, and uh, holidays and made uh, the single drawing that was 25 feet long in our studio. And it was, he didn't even lift the pen. So you can see fish and trees and palm trees and his kind of profiles. And the thing, he, we couldn't do it out of metal because this is less than, more than four inches. A kid could stick his head inside of this. So we created a cantilevered system, half inch glass that would support with no verticals. It supports on its own at the ground and connects together by a continuous handrail. And then we laminated a piece of art glass that was glass blown and painted gr uh, gold and silver uh, and laminate. That was built by a former classmate from uh, Architecture Glass in, in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Jose asked for our lobby uh, also of our lobby drawing because it was a, such a crazy kind of lobby. Um, so he thought that it would be really amazing to have each lobby, the one towards the East be about sunrise and abundance and, and, and manifesting like nutrients of the fish coming off of Bayshore Drive uh, and, and um, birds flying in through the doors, um, the fish flying, uh, swimming upstream of the, of the gradual ramp. Um, and at the other side, uh, facing west at the nighttime, celestial gods and spirits, um, you know, the, the falling star going through the ramp and his mythical figures. And to make it even more extraordinary, we used recycled mirror uh, so that the little aggregate in the epoxy terrazzo would just sparkle at night. We used like recycled plastics to make this uh, kind of uh, ochre, kind of red uh, colors. And, 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 and we asked, uh, someone asked, what, what are the hands? And he said, you know, it's kind of like the two buildings reaching across each other to shake their hand. Um, but he also said it's sort of a metaphor for applause. So he just wanted the two lobbies to be two hands that looked like they were kind of applauding. Um, so uh, another uh, artist, Gary Moore, a public artist, had been in Miami for a while. Um, he did a, a plaza based on a thing called Pharaoh's Dance. It's a, uh, not a thing. It's an awesome song by Miles Davis. It's this idea of this Egyptian African sort of Middle Eastern desert of beautiful uh, kind of grains of sand and these little pieces of metal that were discovered as the sand blows. And he took one of the pieces of powder, raised it up and created a little kind of saxophone jazz, that guy that plays the saxophone and the trumpet outside of everywhere you go. Well, he was creating a little kind of platform for that person. Um, Anna Murch, uh, uh, British uh, and San Diego uh, artist, she found coral on site. Um, and she said, wow, this feels like an architecture, archeological dig. I would love it if it felt like we found things. So she created these travertine benches um, that were kind of broken in the middle with cleft finish. There's polish, there's honed, uh, there's flame, you already heard in cleft where you break it and you jackhammer it or, uh, and you make it feel rough. <clears throat> She also was inspired by the, the, the ocean bottom at the Keys. Um, the idea that kind of the sand sort of ripples from the motion of 
of this awesome power of the ocean. So she created these panels that would kind of uh, slope and plan. They would slope and section, um, and they would curve in different directions. And not exactly. Some would be wide, some would be narrower and closer to each other, so that the sound of the water coming down would be louder in places near the road, the highway, and, and less loud. These were going to be precast panels, um, and they, because of 3D modeling and in uh, uh, fabrication, manu uh, uh, construction fabrication, uh, digital fabrication, um, the, the, the stone builder said, you know, you're going to spend a lot more money making these out of fo formed concrete than stone. Like, no way. And he did a budget, and it was travertine marble, um, cheaper than cast concrete. <clears throat> so water likes to go, you know, again, this thing goes in a curve from the street up. Water loves to kind of fall down because gravity, this thing called gravity, water likes to go out in an equal distance, but the whole half of the fountain was empty if, if, if the fountain uh, trust, uh, trough was like this. So we had to build little stainless steel boxes, tiny ones that went all the way down the edge of the, um, the um, fountain so that you'd get this effect. And you can see the precision of the fabrication. This is almost just an eighth inch joint and every one of these was carved away and nobody was jacking this thing uh, out of stone we would put it on the put two inches of travertine on a bed the water jet would come by we'd go and drink uh, delicious uh, italian wine all night and we'd come back and 10 of these panels would be done um, and you can see this is a sort of a overexposure but that's water going through it on the night that we tested the lighting um, never forget it was this big kind of dark man with seven children sitting in a van. The wife was uh, feeding them Pizza Hut or Domino's. And when it came on, he was practically crying. And I said, you gotta go get your kids. <clears throat> and his kids were the kids that were just running around this thing, the first ones that could enjoy, literally running around at 10 o'clock at night. Couldn't believe dad just like did this. <laughs> like, um, and you know, uh, I, one of the concepts of the, of the spending money of uh, putting travertine marble underneath a water fountain was that Parker Thompson and Judy and all of them said, you know, fountains don't work in Miami. So they often go dry because they break, like the Klaus Oldenburg over at the Stephen P. Clark Center. It's never had water since I've known it. And they said, they wanna, if it's gonna be, have to be maintained or break, we want it to look good when it's dry. So that was the idea, is when there was no water, you didn't say, oh shit, the, the fountain's not working today. Um, and it would give that ephemeral, that kind of beautiful kind of like, could really tell what's up and down at night, this whole experience, if you haven't been there lately, or it, it's just incredible. Robert Sakonich uh, was to, gonna do the paint, uh, a painting on the curtain. We told him he couldn't do bulldogs playing poker. Uh, he couldn't do Elvis Presley, and he couldn't do uh, the American Eagle. Uh, so he did this series of flowers, tropical flowers, and this is Caesar and him with the model and different options. Uh, this is it in the model. We did a mock-up at the Miami uh, County Auditorium. Uh, this is the size of the, the, uh, the curtain, and, and we just took this chunk and hung it. He had this scanned in Berlin, and then he would go with spray bottles, like Windex bottles of his own pigment, and he would just spray in different areas. So it was literally a, a painting. Um, he created palm fronds on the bottom, so if you walked out with a beautiful dress, or a kind of really loud tuxedo, uh, you wouldn't be kind of have a backdrop of all this kind of beautiful kind of patterns of tropical um, uh, flowers. And, and that's what it looks like in the, in the hall. At, at the concert hall, he, we, we, we were gonna get a, there was talk about getting an organ, a traditional organ. And because we could not, by the time we were building and it was, we needed to put it in, we couldn't find an organ donor. And that's actually a real phrase. We needed an organ donor to write a check to build the uh, organ. And so many people lost their liver and kidney and, and part of their brain on this project. Um, we decided to do a kind of a, a, a fabric in case um, it would come. And this was, he took sand dollars and again, Miami-Dade County Auditorium, we printed it on kind of theater scrim. And Caesar said, that's Caesar here. He said, wow, this looks like a, you, a, why a, a bride's veil. We should make it as transparent as possible. Um, so we put it in place. 
that we started testing what it would look like. And it was, he said, when the organ comes, she'll be a beautiful lady that does not have to be completely visible. So this was the effect. And, and when they do, if and when they ever do get an organ, she's got a beautiful veil to kind of partially uh, hide her face. The Kundo Bermudis, uh, at 92 years old, um, he didn't think that he'd ever see this thing finished. Um, killer painter from the 40s. He did a painting of like uh, artists making a, a box, a machine that makes artists, it was called in Spanish. You'd put like textiles and hats and it would spit out these sort of Shakespearean kind of Greek uh, tragedy people. And we didn't know where to put his painting, so we stuck it in the studio theater, which was 70 feet by 30 feet. That thing had to be made out of tile, and the first mock-ups looked like the bottom of a swimming pool in Cancun, like turtles swimming. So we told them, if you had plenty of time, would you be interested in, if we gave you all the time in the world, could we value engineer? You can take all your time, but can you break the pieces into one inch by one inch, half inch by one inch, and half inch by half inch? And then uh, they said, yeah, if we have all the time in the world, we'll give you that. And then Kundo came and started blending all the colors with different kind of co contrasting and complementary colors to create a bigger effect. So the guys came to bring it when they were three quarter done and we were obviously not finished. We weren't even done, started practically, just the steel was in place, but they brought them in these pizza sized boxes and they laid this thing out on the floor. And, and later this uh, group of Polish brothers uh, who were killer craftsmen, they literally designed it so that it zigzagged. There was no joints and they were pieced together like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is Kundo at 92. He saw it um, built right before opening night uh, in place and he died two years later in 2008. Um, there's another artist that nobody knows about, but they, there was a cinematographer from University of Miami and they did a film called The Culture of Structure. And it was a documentary on the other five artists. So if you guys want to see it, I have a CD. And uh, for like $1,000 a ticket, uh, I'll do a Zoom event. Um, just kidding. Um, and then the Ballet Opera, this is uh, when we start getting to some of the heavy mock-ups. Uh, the idea was to create a, a, a not these specialized booths where all these multi-million dollars people buy them and fall asleep, millionaires buy them. We wanted the balconies to kind of come in and stop at different sections and let these things kind of grow out of the frame of the facade. So we, you know, as tight as we wanted to keep, I'm like on the third level, that's the Broadway extra seat level, but we pushed the curves that are almost aligned linearly, keeping the, the, the horseshoe shape like, uh, like La Scala and the orchestra pit. But one thing that mattered very much to Caesar when we still had scaffolding, he wanted to sit at the 2400th and 99th seat. He wanted to see what the worst seat in the house looked like. And so I'm standing taking this picture, but when you sit in the seat, you can see the entire proceeding, part of the orchestra pit, but certainly the entire stage when it's raised up because it's a lift also. So, you know, he cared about the very last person um, that was coming into that hall. And this is how, how it came out. And, and each one of these were like, you know, a custom, not a custom, but because they were the same, but it was like a little Maserati. You know, there's names associated with all these boxes and you can actually buy a ticket there because those people don't go all the time. Their name is associated because it was part of helping build the center. Uh, but you can get a ticket in some of these boxes. And just so that they can sit in their Maserati, we built a full-size mock-up inside the building so that you can kind of go up there, sit down, and enjoy. Now, to build this was like eight different trades. Electrician, a wood guy, a fabric guy, a stucco guy. You know, it was crazy. A wood, uh, and then the thing, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is this big acoustic uh, canopy. It was, a, it was a disc that had to hover among the stage. Because we weren't using speakers, sound could go up into this thing and like uh, bounce into several million directions so that highs and lows would reach your ear at every seat. And at the orchestra pit, when the music comes out, these people lose sound often because it's just flying over their head. They were, they were a virtual Damien des and Arctic designed them, the big ones in the middle at the end and the little ones in the middle. And Caesar said, can't we make this feel like a chandelier or like a constellation of stars? 
but it had to be built out of five inch thick plaster applied three times with metal in between so that cracks would not register. So it would be plaster, lath, plaster, lath, and letting it dry for days, sometimes weeks. And this guy on his lunch break, young, young PM, assistant PM, he would come up and sand these things himself, created templates out of wood to sand these perfectly, and that's what it looked like. And at the end, we said, let's put some fiber optic little crystals, real crystals at the end, so that when the lights go off in the hall and the dome slowly dims, there's little constellation of stars left and then that dims and then the curtain rises. And we found out that the little boxes that kind of feed electricity to crystal make a lot of noise. They've got fans, so we had to lift them up and put them outside of the acoustic joint. And then when the scaffolding started coming down, the contractor's like, okay, Mr. Architect, you're all this Mr. Mockup guy, you gotta approve mockups, we have a mockup for you to look at. And they thought that I would freak out, but they put, Elvis Presley, the American Eagle, and the, po the dogs playing poker. And as, if, and as if I was gonna freak, and they were like beach towels. And they said, what do you think? And I said, you know, it may seem un-American, but I don't know, I think maybe move Elvis over and uh, the American Eagle to the left. Um, and then another thing that people don't realize is that there, this is the 15 story building empty inside of the hall. This is above the stage, so you can bring scenes, theater sets, up and down into a 110 foot space. Th these are the chains and when you walk on that grid, you feel like you're gonna fall through it. It's the scariest experience in the world and, and they're only three inches apart. Um, the stage has a full, full stage with kind of scene wagons that come in and out. You can see the, 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 the proscenium even has like a tripod kind of frame that you can close and open for smaller theater. And these giant spaces that could have an entire full stage on the side and the back that can come in and out with these, you know, something like eight ton doors that when they're closed, that's the truck dock, they, there's a bladder that opens, that fills up with air and it seals the sound of the city uh, from the interior. There's a rehearsal room that's the same size as the main stage and all of these things had to be separate because if you, I dropped a VW bus here or they were rehearsing, you can't hear it there. So there's a big 12 inch wall with grout filled. There's a joint, two inch joint that nothing crosses and another 12 inch grout wall. Studio theater is the same. And so to talk about that, imagine this. This is a two inch joint that does not touch this part of the building. This is the rehearsal room. So it's like seven buildings built two inches apart from each other. And if you look really carefully, that joint also goes, goes through down and vertically down the front of the building, all the way to the foundation. And even the foundations below ground, the footing is here, there's insulation. It goes like this with foam and like this, in case sound would go down below the ground, go all the way down to the bedrock 40 feet and migrate back up. So, you know, Damon, I don't know what you were drinking in those days, but um, pretty amazing, excessive, but very worthwhile acoustics. And that's that joint. At no conduit, nothing, no plumbing went across that joint. Each building was self-supporting. And this is how we had to build it. You know, poured in place kind of concrete with fully grouted uh, block. That's the joint going uh, horizontally so that when it bounced, it wouldn't touch those walls. Um, and then we had to kind of fill it with uh, kind of neoprene kind of material and then spray paint it green and they made us go through and walk the whole thing because we heard a story that in Singapore, the Performing Arts Center, they kept hearing a squat in the middle of the freaking like testing and they found an empty bottle of, I don't know, Coca-Cola or green tea or something. And, and that was making that sound. That's how acoustically sensitive this building is. And I'm so sorry. I, I just realized, I'm again, it's impossible to do this. I know that if you guys have to run across campus to a class at 11, you can go now. Just kidding. Uh, not kidding. But here's the steel. Um, it was a composite system. This was the bathtub that we poured into the ground, into the mud, an entire story. But in order to make a very precise building, we had to build it out of steel. Note that the hall was built out of steel. Steel has a, has a tolerance that is very tiny. Concrete in this town had a tolerance that was not so tiny. People were putting block that was three or four inches waving in a wall or in a floor. 
if if the this was made out of concrete the last seat 200 and uh, 2499 to 2500 uh just that little bit of three inches of concrete on that front balcony would cut off four or five inches of the proscenium so this was called a composite system we built the shear walls and the elevator cores out of concrete we built the main kind of performance stages out of steel and then we built the kind of ancillary spaces out of a composite which was steel first and then kind of cast and clay steel with concrete which were tie columns and tie beams and then filled with block and you can see it's just a, as they say, the kids are saying a shit show. Uh, it was just crazy on how they were actually building this thing in different sectors. We didn't understand it. Like steel's almost building here, where's the concrete? I mean, what is going on? Um, I mean, there were 16,000 pieces of steel. If you put them side by side, we calculated that you could walk on it like a balance beam all the way to Key West. Um, that's how much steel there was. You can't even hit a golf ball through this thing. Um, and this was a moment where it was just like a see Jesus in that moment. It was like a ah, weird, it was the first time that the, the, the span was gonna go across the, the Valley Opera Hall. 25 foot deep trusses, literally inching together by two cranes and these crazy amazing heroes of steel coming together to put it together. Um, the other, did I skip one? No. The other uh, crazy uh, heroes, after midnight, after a concert at American Airlines Arena, we thought, which we thought traffic was going to be less, we hoisted a 14 ton, or I forget what, how much it weighed, but let's just call it a million tons. Um, but this thing curves in plan and in section, so it has an eccentric curve. This, this part of it bends down by force, so we had to create these members that jogged and kind of bolted in place. And when this thing got hoisted up, you could hear people screaming and playing music and applauding. And I told them, guys, you like the first performance at the Performing Arts Center. And this is them putting into place, like two in the morning. And this is a photograph taken by my steel assistant PM, um, which he was following me around with my camera because he knew I just loved taking pictures. And he took this extraordinary picture that looks like they're building the building above the above the heavens. But the Performing Arts Center management office um, and Cesar Pelling Associates, they, we couldn't build a, the builder couldn't connect a drawer level, a, a shelf. Um, but the combination of the HVAC, the, 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 the ducts and the steel were just, the, you can't imagine, every single one of these ducts had to be lined in, 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 in insulation inside of it and then another duct. So they were much larger, five or six inches bigger than than all the other ones, squeezing the ducts into the ceiling. That's ceiling right there. So these things had to be insulated so that we're, there would be no sound. This is the rehearsal room. Um, just to give you scale, I put a ladder up here so that I can run out. So I put the camera on timer on my tripod. And I ran up um, to show you that these are the ducts that push air down onto the performance house. What I didn't know that I was climbing up the ladder the wrong way and the whole thing started tipping backwards. So. I tend to be a little um, um, kind of accident prone, um, so, um, but I survived that one. But what happened is the ducks were supposed to be on these spring actuators. They were supposed to have springs here so that when they did shake, it would not register into the structure or the floor of the walls. Every single one of these were flat. The contractor didn't know what they were. So he didn't kind of do it. So they had to go to every single one of everything that was holding a duct and re-unscrew them and rebalance them. So they're all uh, tuned, as we call it. The reverb chamber had to be a 70 foot by 30 foot wall, 12 inch grouted wall, concrete uh, floor, and a concrete ceiling. So kids, tell you guys, I, I shouldn't call you kids, um, fellow architects, how do you pour a concrete ceiling? Like you have to put formwork and peel it off, right? Well, not simple. So what we decided to do is build the ceiling out of precast concrete shapes that would fit inside of this erector set. Triangular shapes that, and, and trapezoidal shapes that would go around. We had to build the ceiling before we built anything else. And that's it. We painted them blue. This is the bridge. These are the wall. The, these doors were the reverb doors. They're like valves on a clarinet or a, or a flute. 
these things would open and close and they were, the smallest one was five tons, the big, these big ones were 12 tons. And they had to open and close seamlessly. They had acoustic material in the front and they were gonna be covered. They opened up and we had to test the opening way up in Sarasota, Florida. Um, the, these things which you never see, they're behind the wood and the fabric, they're meant to do what, the opposite of what, and, and the same thing that the dome did, which is kind of receive sound and push it in many different directions. The problem is, is that they poured the uh, doors in the rain face down and it puddled everywhere. And what they didn't realize is that the inside of the reverb chamber was the most important part that had to be smooth. By the time I rejected 42 of the 84 doors, the entire building had closed in and we had no way of getting them in. We found a, 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 a hoist in Switzerland that could, could like close up like a transformer, fit through a six foot door, and then, um, and then six to eight foot door, and literally picked 84 of these doors. But who can support the weight? So structurally, we had to put um, more structure, temporary lolly columns underneath the stage to support it. Um, and that's the first door that went in. Only 83 left. And this is what the doors look like in place with the kind of, you know, Frank Lloyd Wrightian kind of Usonian pattern. Um, these were cast separately. Uh, and then this is the wood and the fabric that went over. So next time you go, just kind of take your iPhone flashlight and look in there. Um, you'll see them. Um, the acoustic currents, even when you open this up, you didn't always just want it to go bing. You wanted it to go pop and have no like volume, but no reverb. So we designed these, they designed, uh, Damien designed these 70 foot curtains that had to retract from the top. Look at the size of that person uh, inside of the reverb chambers. And these things would come down from a panel and drop. And, and Caesar wanted to paint it blue so that it felt like the hall looked like it was in the middle of um, the woods, like in the Berkshire, like Sashiwa Hall, in Tanglewood, and here are all the doors with the actuators. Um, uh, the, the, the canopy was that thing that raised up and down, but we also wanted to be a chandelier, so we had to make it sort of out of steel and wood, and it was the biggest like piece of furniture we had to build when things were really going freaking crazy in the hall. So we built on the stage, you can see the stage being built for bounce, and we needed to light it, and so we hired a four generation lighting company called Baldinger Lighting and um, they, they uh, built a circular kind of fixture that would kind of move around these rings of standard and, and glow. Um, that's the final thing and I'm just going to rifle through all these. Um, uh, we had a guest and all this was covered. Everything was covered. We had no idea that workers didn't know why we were covering our work. No one had ever seen the project like this. This was two, three months before uh, temper the TCO. And we had no idea who was coming, and all of a sudden everybody's looking through the windows and trying to peeking uh, in there. And, and it, it, it was Parker Thompson, the trust chair, guy on the left, who sort of shepherded this process through. George Burgess, the, the county manager at the time, the heroic, and you'll hear the story. And some guy called Bush, I think he was the governor at the time, but uh, Jeb Bush came to visit us, um, dressed in sneakers, uh, with steel toe, of course, I'm sure. Um, and I always tell my students the quiz question, which one of these does not work for the painting subcontractor? Um, and, and you get an A in the class if you can guess which one. The guy smiling at the camera, if you don't know. And my, my thing was um, Michael uh, Thomas, uh, Philip Thomas, who is Tubbs from Miami Vice. I couldn't believe it. Five, Miami Vice was in my lecture and that dude shows up. I didn't even recognize, I was giving the tour and everybody was high-fiving him. Uh, but he's the, the original Miami Vice for those of you who know, but the real rock star, I think the real artist of the Performing Arts Center is, is, is the concert hall, this beautifully sculpted wood with banners and this machine for making acoustics. Also sort of mock-ups that have the banners that lift up from the back walls of every single tier, um, creating like lighting, lighting that is kind of conduited into these slots. Um, you know, the idea was to create many points of light so it felt dreamlike when you were walk into the hall, you just felt like you were trans transported somewhere like a dream. And people don't know this, but 
late in the project, they, 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 they hired the theater planner to design a banquet uh, floor. Uh, and, and, and its idea is to put a floor on top of the seats because they wanted to have a fancy dinner party. And you can imagine, and not, not touching the seats, that was a project all by itself. Uh, but if you want to have a killer dinner party, you can rent this place out. Um, it's not a bad place to um, have some kind of Chef Boyardee. Um, and this is the right before um, the TCO, and this is when the tuning happened. Greatest or one of the great orchestras in the world is in Cleveland Orchestra, conducted by Franz Most, who was at the, I don't even remember, the Phil, uh, Vienna Philharmonic. They asked people to sit in precise areas and they just played different things so that we can move the doors open and close and raise this thing up and down and move the lights around. And you can imagine opening night, and this is the end, I'm sorry, if anybody's falling asleep, this is the time to wake up because this is the personal part. Um, the, um, the, um, the night of the opening, I, I got insomnia, <clears throat> I'm gonna cry. I got insomnia because I couldn't believe this was actually going to happen. <clears throat> so I got up out of bed and I just went uh, at dawn and I walked around the building <clears throat> and took the very last pictures because I sort of thought they wouldn't let the architect back in the building after all of this. <laughs> so I figured I'd get my pictures out. Um, so these are pictures right before sunrise, uh, the night that we opened. And I just felt like uh, I had died and gone to heaven. <clears throat> Um, the doors were open, polished. I had a little handkerchief with Windex on it in case I saw a little paint splatter. Um, and this is the, the view from Government Cut. This was opening night uh, in the afternoon. They hired a helicopter to take several pictures. And this is the tent that they built to have the giant dinner that we then crossed over and then crossed over. And it was three night opening, Gloria Stefan, uh, well, just tell you quickly, uh, the, the, and this is the view at the time, uh, Carnival had been, done their $20 million donation, uh, but, but, but they were willing to donate somewhere else if someone wanted to donate more. And Adrian Ars asked, what would it take for me to have my name on there? And they said, ah, oh, 30 million. And so she pulled a check out, wrote a check for 30 million, put the building after opening in the black, you know, these things usually run on a deficit. Luckily, this I made out of 3M, peel and stick. So we went back up and peeled off Carnival Center. And then we put up Adrian Ars. Um, but um, what was I saying? Um, yeah, the opening up, we heard all acoustically perfect, everybody singing, and then we hear horrible noise, sounded like hammering. And it was Shaquille O'Neal and uh, Dwayne Wade with basketball bouncing on the stage. And we're like, oh my God. And he's like, oh geez, Shaquille, what are we doing, man? This isn't the AA. Uh, the American Airlines, and he's like, oh man, I think this is that Performing Arts Center. Uh, they're opening tonight. Really? And everybody's laughing. He goes, let's get out of here, man. I mean, I, I didn't even dress for the occasion. And they're in their uniforms. So they walk out, and all of a sudden, the lights go down, the hole in the piano lift on the stage, kind of all the bare lights hit it, and you see this amazing woman dressed in white, I'll stand back, with her microphone above her head, and it's Gloria Stefan raising out of the stage with um, you know, Emilio and his band. Um, so this is the last, I was just going to tell you this very few seconds. This is uh, several people, even before we were open, were real fans. There's a lot of naysayers, but there was an artist that got permission to play seven, eight cameras from the, around the entire site. A little bit of a crazy man um, and smoked a lot, several different kind of types of uh, smoking materials. And he um, can do a 30, uh, 72 months, six year simulation of this whole thing being built from different perspectives. And if you ever wanna see that thing, I will actually show that on a Friday night, maybe even invite him. But this was the day that the camera caught a car accident right in between the highway. And we've never seen car accidents in Miami. So this was an unusual experience, but look at the job site. I mean, it was just a crazy thing. I mean, they thought, yeah, let's just get the first order of steel will be the rear of the building. Um, this was a photographer that lived out in Fisher Island and he just would see it being built from the water and he had to come over and take these extraordinary pictures. You can see the steel bracing holding up the columns after we kind of zippered away, hacked off that part of the building. Um, this is his picture of, um, of the shear wall and you, this is facing west so you couldn't have a lot of glass and we did these little slits 
and those slits. These are Robin Hill, my dear friend, photographer uh, in town. And, you know, he really captured the building as this kind of blank building with these kind of rings of Saturn, these kind of things that catch light, doesn't need windows, these sculptural forms, one building falls into the other. I started taking these crazy cynical pictures about how could we be putting finished stone here and we don't even have glass and these are all the little marks I personally put on the entire Sears building to fill all the cracks that are making it look terrible. Um, this was my architects from New Haven from Pelly's office in a what we call an oh shit moment because uh, we weren't exactly sure how that steel uh, member was going to be finished. Uh, and this was another oh shit moment where the builders were from Brazil, uh, Odebrecht, the Haskell Company, Ellis, and then Elliston uh, from Florida, Elliston from Canada. So there was like the United Nations over here arguing and my architect over here, so I took this panorama to separate them because otherwise there was going to be a fist fight. And then it's not always cynical. This was when they uncovered the, they had to do the lanes in separate lanes, right? Because, you know, you can't drive over the whole thing and block off a U.S. federal highway. So this was just surreal. Uh, the, the Persian carpet being unveiled. And this is like the, the, the window of the world. The, again, you have to find this window. Um, but just loved it. And this is the great Caesar Pelli. Um, this is the, the artist formerly known as my wife. And this is me that looks like I'm about to walk them to their seat or I'm the valet guy. Uh, but it didn't matter because this is pretty much the biggest, biggest day of my life, uh, except for when my kids were born. Um, and that was a week before we started construction. And my little guy, Sebastian, would take pictures of it all the time. He'd call it dad, dad, wow. We'd go buy it and they'd go, dad, dad, look at it. And then we'd go, wow, all of us in the car. So the building became dad, dad, wow. Little would we know 12 uh, years later, um, Sebastian would be on the stage at Woolsey Hall at Yale conducting his first orchestra. He literally breathed the Performing Arts Center dust and his DNA changed. And he then relocated to, to Miami to go to Miami Charts Charter in Wynwood where he's studying now music at FIU. Uh, this is where he meets uh, Franz Most, the equivalent of a kid played basketball meeting, uh, you know, LeBron James, and you, you know, the glow was just crazy. And, and you know, um, just a comment on 2020, these graduates of 2020, this is not them. But I promise my daughter at 15, she has an alias as I do. I am a DJ, DJ Peachy. Uh, she's DJ Chick. And we promise in 2024, we're going to give a concert to uh, all the kids that lost, missed out on their graduation this year. So four years to plan the biggest party in the plaza. Uh, for the graduates. And I'm just going to do two plugs. There's a book out there really good written by Les Stafford. It tells a lot of these stories, but it's a lot more in depth, the politics and how it went in. Really amazing read. And I just have to say, Caesar only read one, wrote one book. And it's my favorite book in art because I didn't read it until after I'd left his office. And he truly, um, really, it's for young architects, but that means all of us. Uh, it really lays out architecture and just a histor the history of architecture in an amazing way. And I just have to say, I, you know, um, this is ironic, uh, Henry, and I just want to tell you, um, yesterday was Caesar's first anniversary of his death, um, July 16th. And uh, after working for him for 23 years, um, uh, at 23, 46, um, and he died at the age of 92 um, in his sleep, having gone to work almost every day starting his own office when he was 50, first office when he was 50, um, in a trajectory of 42 years, uh, 12 of them on this collaborating with him. It's just the biggest privilege of my life. So I'm so sorry I went over. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. I hope there's time for questions. I hope there's more than just the four of us on this thing. But thank you very much, everybody. I look, thank you, thank you. I love FIU School of Architecture. I really do. No, no. Thank you, Roberto. This was a very beautiful talk. And it's great not only to see the building, but also to see, you know, that piece of Miami um, history, right? Which is, I mean, for, for the students who are younger, uh, all that Miami in the 80s and 90s is maybe unknown. But um, a lot of the names and, uh, and the, 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 the actors of that you just mentioned are the people that really made, I mean, we're here because of all those efforts and all those, yeah. um, um, you know, all that energy that was put 
um, at a time when, as, as you said, I mean, it was difficult to foresee the future of Miami as a, as a city like this. So it takes a lot of uh, vision and, and, um, and, you know, tr trust and faith and, and, and optimism to pull this through. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's great. It was great to see. I, don't, I, I, I mean, we, we have a lot of students still here. I uh, just want to open it for questions. I have to run uh, quick, uh, soon because uh, we have another meeting at 11.30, but um, any of the students, you can write it on the chat or um, just feel free to chime in. And, you know, Andrew, you could share my email um, and I will gladly, I'd Perfect. love to. No, it would be great to have you back in the fall because we, we, we're, we're going to be teaching this, I mean, we teach this class summer and fall every year. And it's always yeah, you, do, you do a performing arts center studio. I yeah. Design one of these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty complex buildings. Yeah, I'm always amazed at how. Um, I mean, maybe one of my questions. It's um, I'm always um, impressed by, you know, how you manage to, to get the sort of the US one Biscayne Boulevard to kind of accept the the change of pavers and. And everything that is going on in that small section of you know pretty long um, highway, and um, and I and I always enjoy it, you know, because I live 36th Street and Biscayne Boulevard, so I, I pass wow. by almost every day, um, and I enjoy the kind of slowing down and seeing the, the sort of different sort of urban condition of a street. Um, oh yeah, it's, it was extraordinary. You, you could imagine the approval process, but it just made it. It was just a moment in ur the urban kind of fabric of Miami to just kind of go through that artery and then boom, have this mm -hmm. just, like, space that you feel like you're driving right through. We wanted the people in the car to feel like they were actually patrons or even performers. No, it's great also to see that it's the, the sort of the urban idea of that public space is, was there since day one, since the early sketches. Um, which has nothing to do with the concert hall or with the, uh, with the ballet, but it has to do with the city and with the, sort of the connection of the building with the people and, and public space. I yeah. really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Um, All right. Yeah, we, we, we will need to hear about other projects. Like I will be interested in uh, hearing about the New York Times competition. Um, <laughs> Right, um, and so many other projects, like Cesar Pelli had done so, much, so, so many buildings that are like, so uh, complex. Yeah, I know. in, in tw 23 years, it was pretty extraordinary. When I started in 85, there were very few buildings were actually projects that we thought were gonna be getting built and the trajectory just uh, just soared. The Petronas Towers, the World Financial Center, Ronald Reagan Airport in Washington, D.C. Now, now it's the sun, right? No, it's, it's, it's the son and his partner, Fred Clark, kind of followed Caesar from UT when, when he graduated to LA. And then when he went, became dean at Yale in 77, Fred came to New Haven with him, went across the street, sort of the everything guy. They hired a few students. True story, they just hired a bunch of students Caesar's first summer um, at Yale. And they won the competition to do the MoMA residential tower in New York City. So that put it on the map as an office. And then the next year they won the World Financial Center just with students. It was just mm -hmm. part-time summer students. And, and then they just kept came coming from all over. And then eventually from Argentina and Uruguay. And, and I, I enjoyed very much being in this mosaic of culture in a design studio. People just like their students, you know, there were not a lot of older gray beards, um, but it was a real culture of, of design and, and uh, you know, studio. You can see our process. It was really much, very much like the studio. I still try to work like that. And fortunately, you know, I didn't get a chance to say at the beginning, but I've I'm I'm uh, I've joined Eniad. I'm, I'm working with them. And and talk about a studio who spoke last week, Tom Wong. Talk about a studio that kind of takes the richness of process and makes things and, and designs buildings all the way to the end it's i'm just again forrest gump i'm just privileged and it's amazing <laughs> um but yeah it, it's it's a uh, i'm a lucky guy no yeah great and also great to work not only with the architecture with the, all the artists and everybody that was around a project of this sense of complexity right like you know because everything is is a critical detail like there's yeah. nothing left out of like okay no never mind like everything is is, is you know fundamental for the the whole idea of the building right
Right. Professor, can I ask a question? Sure. Hi, Robert. Um, I th I thought the the talk was really great. I you know I want to commend you on the like the energy. It's really inspiring, like the way you talk about architecture, and um, I really appreciate you talking about this project in particular because I visited before the, this this building, and just knowing what's happening behind the scenes and what took to make to get it done, it's pretty incredible just to know about these things. But my question was just about just if you could maybe talk about this um it sort of seemed like i got the impression that there was a lot of problem solving with this project and it sort of seemed like that things were presented that you had you guys had to go back and go back to the drawing board figure things out so i'm just wondering how much of that actually happens because we have this idea as students that you know you do construction drawings and and or, or that you know the building is it's drawn and it's all figured out <laughs> but in a project like this, it seems like, you know, like things happen in the real world, things, people make mistakes, things are not constructed the way they should, and they need to be fixed. So if you could mention that, and, and by the way, also, you know, you gave, you were a crit in one of my studios, and it was one of the best crits, you know, I really, <laughs> I really enjoy the way you talk about architecture, and it's very insightful and very passionate. I, I, it's pretty inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I feel it in my gut, you know, it's, uh, but it's really, really great question. And, and I guess I could encap encapsulate it like this. You know, we did, we were associated with two local architects and, and there wasn't one architect that could do both buildings at the same time. So we took one architect, Rodriguez and Quiroga, that did uh, one of the buildings and Wolf Bergavras did, did the other building. And um, they um, left the project before the bid envelopes uh, were open and and for my benefit, I mean, actually, they would would I would have never been on site, right? I would have never been on the project. But there were sixteen hundred sets of draw, uh, sheets of drawings. The drawings would come up above my desk uh, if you put them flat. Twenty seven hundred pages of specifications, and Damien's uh, acoustic book, which called the Art Tech Bible, was two inches thick of all the acoustic requirements. We thought we had it all figured out, and I could have basically practically thrown those drawings out. Um, being on site every day. No senior architect design guy is the guy on a construction site living in a trailer every day. For six years, I went to a trailer every day and it was, we called them oh shit moments because we'd, I'd be like, oh shit. I'm like, did you look at the drawings? And they're like, well, no, it's just that the, the, he didn't get the right shot. And I'm like, or our drawings would be messed up. And we would, and I would call these oh shit moments 59 second moments. I would be upset for 59 seconds. And I would time myself at the beginning because it was hard to be not upset for longer. And then at 59 seconds, I would do like architects. I'm like, okay, so let's, we should do. And if you're designing there and you'd been working with the model, I mean, I encourage you. This was a major project to be involved in, right? But anything, just an addition to your mom's and dad's house, being there as often as you could, it's when you really do start making the real decisions. 51% of architecture happens when you break ground, not in your drawing. You think you're 80, 90% done after CDs? You haven't even seen half of the decisions you have to make. So, so you just have to have thick skin, strong stomach, put your ego at the door, Realize that your builders are your friends and they end up being your drinking buddies after really bad nights or days. And some of them are my best friends now. So that's it. It's not adversarial. You got to make relationships. Life's too hard to burn long to burn bridges. And, and that's why I'm back in Miami. I moved to Connecticut. I'm back in Miami because that, that's a killer building to walk people through and put my like 5,000 construction workers, 27 consultants, you know, uh, builders from three different countries. I, that's, my, that's my peeps, right? So I want to be in the town that I can enjoy that and still keep collaborating. And now bringing ENIAD here and working together, you know, we might not do an astronomy museum, maybe, but we're going to continue to make Miami the, the, one of the great cities in the world for architecture now uh, and the real destination that it deserves to be. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, the one of the, the, the sort of the goals with this class that we're teaching in integrated building systems and comprehensive design studio is to kind of show students a little bit of that complexity and like coordination, how critical it is and how difficult at the same time it is. Um, and yes, being at the job site, I mean, that's the real learning experience. And, yeah. Um, yeah, you can't do it otherwise. You can't do yeah. it. Those, those pictures of looking up, I was taking those because we had no idea what we're gonna do. And having me on site, you know, like for a beginning, it was like, oh yeah, we're gonna have to run that by Caesar. And at one point, two, three years into the project, Caesar was like, no, Roberto, you gotta just do this. And I'm like, Caesar, I've, I've been in design my whole life. I've never been a full-time site rep. And he's like, he did this inhale laugh. He goes, uh, uh, Roberto, don't worry. No one's ever done this. <laughs> like, so like, I can't mess up that bad if no one has ever done what I was actually doing out there. So I just did my best. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. So yeah, Roberto, so we'll, we'll, we'll reach out to you because the students will have more questions for sure. And, um, and yeah, I have your email and um, it would be great to reconnect. Um, That's great. Yeah, no, I'm the a... semester ends and then for next fall. Yeah. Um, Henry, super yes. quick question. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. per perfect. Oh, um, my name is Laura De La Vega. I'm also a student for uh, Professor Henry Real when I was at FIU. Um, Roberto, thank you so much for the lecture. I'm a professor now at Miami Tech College. I have some of my students in the lecture and I would like Henry, if you can uh, share uh, his information in case that my students have questions. Yes. Actually yeah. doing a project. I teach materials and construction. So this, this, this uh -huh. is a fantastic lecture uh, for them. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Oh yeah. And there's pieces of this lecture you could imagine. I could have expanded on any, I did expand on most of all those things in an entire lecture. So, I mean, I'm, I really apologize. There's just it's very difficult. I mean, you can't talk about this building without the context and the competition and you can't really talk, you know, and then, it, but, you know, I'm so glad you're online because Miami Day, I've, I've been a critic at FIU. I've taught studio and given lectures at UM. Um, I've been over at New World School of the Arts and I've not been to Miami Dade. I would well, love- Well, I teach, I, would I teach, I teach all the courses of materials and construction and, and building and construction documents, design one and design two. So I find out about this lecture because again, on Henry, I'm always uh, you, on Henry. top of everything that he does. He's fantastic. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then, um, I, I mean, that's why I was saying I would like to, to have your information. I would love it. Do yes. yeah, the no, students have any question or anything no, about Laura. the- Yep, so yes. Hi, Laura. I didn't recognize Hi. you because your name is not on the on the little thing. I know, I'm using Laura my says iPhone. working. Yes, yes. but uh, no, great to see you. Uh, great to Thank hear that you. you're teaching. So these, yes. these lectures are, are, are being recorded. So I will send you the recording. Um, Perfect. When I receive it from Zoom, I mean, I'll send a copy to Roberto also. So and then, awesome. but, but absolutely, I want one-on-one -on -one connections with the students. I gave tours to people. My favorite tours of the students, I gave a tour of a bunch of little eight, nine-year-olds uh, a little bit ago from a school place called the Miami Fine Arts Academy. Um, yeah. It's, it's just, that's what this place is for. It's not for us old farts, you know, it's for like these kids that are going to take their grandkids. So, and architects, you know, that's a, that's a building that it's very underestimated, you know, not underestimated. It's just, they're just too much that nobody, people don't mm -hmm. understand it. And I used to give tours of it and they are our tours one days and Saturdays that have listened to my lecture and they do it, they can't do it now. But I, I'm actually thinking about wanting to do these tours or something on Wednesdays or Saturday virtually just to keep people connected and, and really talk about the arts and the performing arts. You know, even the funkiest kind of quirkiest, shyest little kids, kid, the arts tends to wrap their arms around them. And we're architects in that kind of space in that world. And, and I love, I love architect. And, and I'm telling you, recommend that book to all your, anybody you know. It will take you from the Crystal Palace. It'll take you from, you know, gardens in Kyoto. It, it really moves you through really the, the, traje the trajectory of what it is to be a young architect, which I still consider. Yes. I, I still consider ourselves. Thank but you yes, very I, much. It was awesome. Yeah. So I want to, I want to, um, I want to be in my day. My daughter at 15, who lives with her mother, who just started high school year, she just told me, because she's been online, my son goes to school here at FIU, but 
She said, Dad, you know, I think I want to go to Miami Dade College. They've got this honors program thing, and this and that and the other thing, and you know, I can save money my first two years, and then and I'm like, oh, I love my daughter. <laughs> I love my daughter. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good way. Of in it. But this is this was great. I tried to take my students um, to some site visits because uh, I work for Paris and Paris and Urban uh, Architects um, um, in Corey Gables. Uh, and then I teach part time on Miami Dade College. But teaching the materials and construction class uh, is very important for the students to be very handy when it comes to these real projects and they can actually um, listen to people that were involved in the schematic design to design development so this was fantastic thank you very much i really thank appreciate you. it nice to meet you all right Pressure. so I, I i really have to run and you're have another meeting at 11 30 and i have to close this to open the next one good well, so, thank, thank you roberto thank you robert it was great thank you so thank much you, everybody it was thank so you, everybody. great thank you to let me in your class <laughs>